when we're all done here. But if you notice, there's a whole lot going on around this building. So if you've never been in here, we have so much happening. So we've got our child's play exhibit that is open, which is perfect for you guys. Um, and that's the, on the history side of the wing. And then we also are working on um, developing the energy side of the building. We have a lot of events coming up, and so um, there's a lot of partnerships um, that we have happening as well. So um, there is a rug braiding class on, five, on uh, Thursday, May 16th. Um, we have a partnership with Lawrence's Acting Out, and once a month, they come in here and do a one act play table read. So they are doing one of those called Intermission Room on Saturday, May 18th. Um, we also do a lot of programs around energy and climate. Um, so we have a program on um, May 21st called Electrify Your Home. Um, there is also a film Common Ground on May 28th, which is about uh, regenerative farming, and that is in partnership with the North Andover Sustainability Committee and also the North Parish Climate, Climate Justice Team. And then on um, June 1st is first Saturday, our Parson Barnard House will be open then free. And on, last of all, on June 18th, we have a author Chris Butcher coming in um, about his book, The Original Bucky Lou, who was the first African-American basketball player who was actually from Lowell. So um, we've got a lot going on. See our events, check our website, and um, come, come back for something else. Um, so I want to remind everybody about safety things. Um, so please put your cell phones and any other noisemakers into silent mode during the program. Um, if you would refrain from any eating or drinking in the theater, please. Bathrooms are through the boardroom and on the right. Please be sure to shut the door when you're done so the fans don't interrupt the speaker. And in case of emergency, the main exit is back where you came. And then there's also an exit here out the front door. Um, on the side door. Um, we have our partner, Brian Frazier from North Andover Cam, who will be recording. So I just like to say that in case you want to ask a question at the end, I want you to make sure you know we're recording. Um, and no nonprofit can function without members and volunteers. And if you like what we're doing and would like to be a part, there's a membership application and a volunteer sign up sheet in the lobby. Um, so, with that said, I would love to introduce our speaker this evening, Andy Sherman, who is board president of the Friends of Harold Parker. When Andy, his wife, and three children moved to Andover 28 years ago, they didn't realize or appreciate that their new home was within a stone's throw of Harold Parker. As he said, it's a long stone's throw, but it's a stone's throw. Um, over the years, Harold Parker became central to the family's recreational activities, including casual walks, power hikes, runs, and especially for Andy, mountain bike riding. He had his first mountain bike ride in Harold Parker and got hooked on the sport leading to 10 years of competitive racing in New England and nationally, and he's now back to recreational riding after his back heels. <laughs> uh, mountain biking in Harold Parker got him introduced to the New England Mountain Bike Association, which promotes riding activities and is also heavily involved in trail maintenance and development. He started helping out on trail projects and has led the last three major boardwalk builds done in HP. He met other Harold Parker enthusiasts who were forming a friends group uh, to support the main goals of the state forest, conservation and recreation. He helped to organize and charter the Friends of Harold Parker and serves as board president. And please join me in welcoming Andy Sherman to talk about this very special place so dear to his heart. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Okay, well, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to talk to you tonight, and uh, let's talk about what we're going to cover. Um, I wanna start way back with a little geology, and uh, for first disclaimer is I'm not a geologist, um, but then again, I'm not a historian either, and here I am talking about history, so. <laughs> uh, but I have an interest, and uh, 
I guess I, I even was a history major, so uh, I've got some experience, although I'm dating myself because that was decades ago. But anyway, uh, we're going to talk about the uh, indigenous, the first settlers of, of uh, the, the HP area. So everything I'm going to do is has going to have a Harold Parker slant to it. Uh, early settlers and a couple of uh, families in particular I want to key in on, the Osgoods. Um, uh, very well known in uh, North Andover, but uh, they actually had a, a big impact on Harold Parker as well, uh, and the Jenkins family. And uh, I've got a real personal interest in them, and I'll tell you why later. Um, and then we'll get into the um, actual uh, formation of the state forest uh, in the 30s, the Civilian Conservation Commission, and uh, a little bit about today and what uh, specifically I'm going to talk a little bit about what the friends do. So uh, this is HP. This is the state map. Uh, those of you who got one of our friends maps, we put this together because if you take this state map and are a rookie at Harold Parker, you're almost guaranteed to get lost. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the initial experience that most people have when they go into Harold Parker without a map, which is to get lost. And so we've now, uh, the friends have created this map, and we'll talk more about some of the other things we've done um, and w in terms of trails and loops and things like that. But anyway, uh, so Harold Parker uh, covers four towns, or is in, is in four towns, I should say. Um, North Andover, Andover, Middleton, and uh, North Reading. And it's just about uh, 32, 3,300 uh, acres. Um, and uh, today, you know, uh, there's, there's hardwood uh, like oak and also a lot of, uh, lot of pine. Uh, and, uh, you know, for being just outside of uh, Boston, it's, it's a pretty amazing resource. Um, I will say, uh, and I, whether you think this is a good thing or a bad thing, I think the mountain bikers have uh, brought a lot uh, wider uh, audience into Harold Parker. Um, so we have uh, an annual event that you get about between, somewhere between 600 and 800 mountain bikers from all over the Northeast actually coming. Uh, that's in October. Um, one of the things, when I, I moved to uh, Andover, um, we always heard that you got to be careful in Harold Parker. It's not safe. There are a lot of weirdos around. And uh, there, there, were, <laughs> there were some uh, sketchy people. Uh, I have talked to, uh, I'm not trying to be self-congratulatory, but talking to uh, people who have lived in the area and, and been longtime users of Harold Parker, um, the mountain bikers and the presence there has helped to, uh, if not totally drive out, at least minimize that, that weirdo factor. Uh, so anyway, um, and this is a, a screenshot of the map that I handed out. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about the uh, Berry Pond up there, kind of this area. Uh, there's a lot of history right, right around there, uh, and so we'll get into that. And I'll, I'll try to uh, reference the map, so if you can need to or would like to uh, follow along on the map, you can do that. So uh, as far as the geology, um, so uh, as it says here, it, it was part of uh, God, Gondwana. That was a, uh, one of these supercontinents. Um, so actually, uh, the, really the east shore of Massachusetts and all, about halfway out the state um, didn't exist uh, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago. And this Gondwana broke up and crashed into uh, New England. And that's really how our landform was established. Um, other pieces broke off and that uh, became uh, England and uh, Gibraltar, as you see. So it, it uh, had a, a pretty big impact. Um, and there are uh, all these terrains, which are these giant blocks 
of, uh, of bedrock and, and matter that uh, uh, just moved as a whole piece, uh, all done by these plate tectonics floating around the, the world as they do. Um, so that was kind of the formation of the, the, the uh, bedrock. And then the whole uh, terrain got changed by the uh, glacial activity. So 100,000 years ago, um, uh, and uh, th this varies depending on what source you read. It's either 100,000 or 50,000 years ago, and then to about 20,000 years ago. Uh, this area was covered by two feet, uh, two miles rather, of ice in the, uh, uh, the Laurentide ice sheet. This was in the Wisconsin ice era. So that uh, picture just gives you an idea of, you know, this whole how far down that ice sheet went. Uh, and as I say, it, it, it was a, a mile or two miles thick in some places. Um, so. When that uh, glacier dis started to recede, it had major, major impact on the terrain in New England uh, or everywhere that it, it uh, was. But uh, here, and in Harold Parker, I called out a few things in particular that the glacier left. Um, sorted sand and gravel, there's a big gravel pit uh, in Harold Parker, and so that was one of the uh, impacts of the uh, um, glacier. Eskers, these are long, uh, not really high, but uh, at least in HP, they're some, in some places about 10 feet high. It's a snake-like ridge uh, that was created by the, uh, uh, the recession of the glacier. Kettle holes, um, so a kettle hole is, um, you may have a picture on that, so uh, but basically, a huge block of ice uh, would be trapped and even covered up by some of the uh, uh, sediment as the glacier receded. And then when the ice melted, it left a big hole. And those are uh, what are called uh, kettle hole ponds. There are two of those in, in HP. And then drumlins. Um, most of what we think of or I think of as hills uh, in Harold Parker are Drumlins. So uh, specifically, uh, and uh, I don't know, I didn't mention the erratic, but we have a spectacular erratic in, in HP. Um, it's right off of Jenkins Road on the Andover side in that area I was kind of circling on the map. Um, and uh, so erratics were left as the, uh, again, when the, the glacier receded, they're just pulling all this materially along with it. Uh, and there uh, can be the, the same material as the bedrock, but in many cases, it's actually the erratics are being pulled from way far away. So the, um, uh, the ice had come from the northwest to the southeast. Uh, and so as it receded, it had pushed you know, rock that was coming from uh, potentially very far away. So that's why an erratic can be a totally different kind of uh, structure or, or composition than the, the normal uh, terrain. Then uh, kettle ponds, there are two, berry pond and bear, uh, bear pond. So those two ponds in Harold Parker, there are 11 ponds total. Um, those are the two natural ones. Uh, the others are all man-made, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, and then, as I said, there are a number of uh, drumlins uh, in HP, and uh, Woodchuck Hill is the tallest, and then, which is in North Andover. Uh, Osgood Hill, and this is not the Osgood Hill of North Andover, there's an Osgood Hill in Andover, and uh, it's, uh, we'll talk about that because of the Osgoods. So, uh, kind of jumping ahead, uh, millions of years. <laughs> Uh, so the first settlers uh, of this area were, of course, uh, not Europeans, but rather uh, Native Americans, Indians, indigenous people. And uh, the, the group that uh, was most predominant here, or Pentecooks, um, you know, is 
when the ice receded uh, or after that happened, so 10,000, 12,000 12, years ago, this area started to get inhabited. The Penacook in this area um, very much lived near rivers, um, so the Merrimack, uh, in Ando, uh, in HP rather, the, the area of concentration was the Skug River. And the Skug, that'll keep coming up, the Skug, uh, as we, we talk. Um, but they, uh, they, they, did, they weren't nomadic like the Plains Indians. Uh, they uh, established uh, some pretty significant uh, uh, places to live with their wigwams, and then they ended up uh, building those up uh, into a, a real village. Uh, fortified villages, as it says, with uh, potentially the longer uh, longhouses. But they uh, were hunter-gatherers, basically, so they did farm, they uh, trapped and, and hunted, uh, and they also, uh, as, as was the case really across the whole country, uh, seemed to have a, a real understanding of forest management, so the burning and uh, the kind of uh, approach they took to maintaining a healthy forest, um, which I think we still have not figured out. Um, so uh, early in the 1600s, as the English in particular started to populate or started to uh, migrate over to uh, New England, there were about 12,000 Penacook in the area. Um, as soon as uh, contact with the English, in particular, was made, there were some Spanish explorers, but the Im English were the first real uh, European settlers who were doing hunting and trapping and a little bit of farming initially. Uh, they uh, just brought all the European diseases that the uh, natives didn't have immunity to, so the uh, uh, the loss of life was just pretty phenomenal. So uh, within uh, uh, 30, 50 years, uh, the population had been decimated. So as the uh, English started to settle in this area, the, it, the uh, native population was already significantly reduced. And by the way, I, um, I can take questions. It, it, if any come up as we go, or we can do some at the end too, but I don't want to just yak. <laughs> so um, there weren't uh, necessarily significant uh, encounters or battles or, or wars with the, uh, the local uh, se uh, European settlers and the, the uh, indigenous people. There were a lot of wars going on. Uh, so in the 1600s, the Pequot War, that was south, so that didn't really affect this area that much. Um, but you can see in 1642, for a couple of years actually, the, uh, the local settlers uh, basically captured Juan Lancet, uh, who was the son of the sachem, the, the Penacook sachem. They held him hostage. And the, the deal was um, kind of a, a non-aggression uh, pact uh, in order to return one lot So they did, uh, the Penacook did sign that. Um, and uh, they uh, were already feeling the squeeze, even though this area wasn't really very populated, but there was already this incursion of, of uh, uh, foreigners, basically, who were um, starting to push them out. Uh, that and, of course, all the disease. So uh, the, the King Philip's War um, was more north, but there was some uh, impact locally. Uh, so north by, you know, uh, basically the northern New England and uh, New York. Um, that's really where that war happened, but there was uh, it was a tense time. Everybody knew that the war was going on and there was a little bit of uh, conflict. And this area, or era, 
is really two when there had been um, more settlers come into this area um, and the formation of the towns uh, and so forth. So uh, anyway, the wars kept going. The, the uh, King William's War didn't really impact, once again, locally. Um, but the uh, Penacook, for the most part, just uprooted and moved north. And they, really, they joined with the Abenaki, uh, particularly in New Hampshire. So I mentioned the Skug, and uh, that is a um, Abenaki uh, word uh, that uh, means Snake River or Black River, not, not clear which one it actually means. Uh, the, the English thought it was a mispronunciation of skunk, so they thought it was a skunk river, but it really, the Skug River, and this is the, uh, the Skug, it runs, it's, a, it's not a long river by any stretch. It runs through Harold Parker into uh, North Reading, Martin's Pond in North Reading. Um, but it was pretty significant for the, uh, for the Indians and then, as you'll see, also for the, uh, the early families that lived in the area. So um, there are, uh, have been six sites, archaeological sites, that have been found along the Skug, primarily, and uh, one was believed to be a, uh, a, a soapstone uh, center where they were making basically uh, pots or uh, uh, bowls. And um, remember the soapstone, because we'll come back to that later. Also, a, uh, uh, further down the Skug and close to north, closer to North Reading was a site where they think uh, dugouts were made. Uh, and so that was, you know, hollow out a, a tree, basically. Um, so uh, those, those villages that I mentioned earlier were all tended to be centered around the, the uh, Skug River in this area, or in the HP area. So um, in the 1600s, the, the settlers started to move in. Um, those of you who are familiar with uh, the Andover, North Andover history, the, uh, this area was really um, established as a town in uh, 1646. Um, but the Indians at this point, as I mentioned, had been really pushed out. There were, uh, it's believed that there were about 300 Indians by the uh, late, 1600s or thereabouts, and they were, some of them or many of them were what are called praying Indians. They had become uh, converted to Christianity. Um, and uh, so, but not really local, not really in the Andover area. Um, as I mentioned, so eight, 1646 was the establishment of the town and uh, the town seal that was adopted in 1951 for Andover um, depicts this, this purchase of land um, by John, the Reverend John Woodridge and, and another guy. So they, you know, six dollars uh, and a coat. Uh, the coat is what uh, that picture is, is showing. He's, he's holding a, a coat uh, and six dollars. So it sounds it makes uh, New York City look like a bargain, right? Because that was $24 or something like that. But, um, you know, <laughs> not a lot, not a lot. Uh, a lot of the early settlers, uh, European or English settlers, uh, came from Newbury, the Newbury area. So that was, that area uh, was way more established early than uh, Andover. And Andover, um, <laughs> was uh, given this charter. Um, there's some extra numbers in there, but it's 
1634, that should read. Oh, 1634 slash five, okay. Can't read it from here. But um, yeah, so the, uh, basically the uh, Massachusetts General Court, which was the representative of the, the king of England at that point, had uh, made the provision for this, uh, these towns or this town, the Andover at that point town, to be established. Um, and uh, that's kind of how that got going. So I, I mentioned uh, going to track a couple of families. One of them was the Osgoods. And again, big name in North Andover, Osgood Street, Osgood Farm, all that stuff. Um, John Osgood was one of the first 10 uh, settlers of Andover. And uh, he actually was born in, in or near Andover, England. So he may have had some impact on uh, the naming. But he moved to Newbury, met all these people like uh, the Reverend Woodridge. So again, one of the first uh, 10 families uh, to, to move here. Um, and shortly after that, he was granted uh, the Osgood family was granted 400 acres, uh, so a land grant. Most, most of Andover at that point, and it was all Andover initially, most of it was what was called common land. And, uh, but land grants were given out to the families, but given there were very few families initially, uh, most of the land in the area, 60 square miles, um, was uh, basically uh, open. But they gave these grants so that you could apply it, uh, you could ask for a specific piece of property. So uh, what happened ultimately was, was Peter Osgood, um, who was the original John Osgood's uh, grandson, uh, made that claim on a big piece of property that is now uh, part of Harold Parker. And the property and the, what became Osgood Farm in Andover <laughs> was, uh, again, 400 acres initially. He grew it to 500. But it ran from roughly uh, Berry Pond, that area, all the way down to what's now the North Reading border. Um, and it encompassed that kind of sweet spot of history that I talked about. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a map too. But um, I'm going to do a little diversion from Harold Parker and talk a little bit about uh, Peter's mother, Mary Clement Osgood, and his father, uh, John Osgood Jr., because they got involved in the whole witchcraft uh, uh, scare. or just the, uh, the uh, craziness, basically, that went on with that. Um, but uh, we'll come back to that. So it's uh, estimated that there were three Osgood houses on the Harold, uh, what's now Harold, uh, Harold Parker. This is one of the three uh, foundations that are right on the Skug River. Um, if you're walking west from the glacial erratic, you'll see this. And then there are two on the other side of the uh, Skug River, just, just like this. Small um, foundations, and uh, they may be Osgood, uh, they may be Jenkins, they may, they're one of the early families that lived in the area. So it's, uh, as far as I know, nobody's identified them specifically as one family or the other. Um, I should have mentioned, too, earlier, is I talked about the six sites, uh, Native American, uh, along the Skug. Uh, when all these families came in and started farming, they just uh, blew away a lot of the uh, archaeology that might have existed. So uh, there's probably a lot that we'll never know. Um, I'll do another aside, too. Uh, I have been, as uh, Lynn mentioned in the intro, I've done a lot with basically building boardwalks 
over the Skug River and in various places uh, for the last number of years. And the last one we did, which was between um, the, basically the campground and Field Pond, it's 170 foot boardwalk because the Skug uh, was flooded uh, way beyond its normal because of beaver activity. Um, it took three years to get the permits for it. One of the things we had to do as we made our, our uh, proposal was make sure that we weren't disturbing anything along the Skug River Bank so that the state archaeologist uh, would be happy. Uh, even though the Skug River Bank is totally underwater, so I don't know that anybody's going to be excavating. Anyhow, um, so yeah, in uh, 1745, Peter Osgood sold the northwest co corner of his uh, Osgood's farm to Samuel Jenkins. So that's the Jenkins family we'll talk about a little bit. Um, and what happened, Peter then died. Uh, he left a lot of debt. His wife ended up selling over time the rest of that 500-acre uh, farm, some of it to the Jenkins and uh, a couple other families as well. So Mary Clement Os Osgood. So she was one of the many people, uh, many people, because it was men, women, and children in Andover who were accused of being a witch in 1692 during the big uh, witch scare. Um, and I mean, this whole thing seems incredible today, but it was one of these mass hysteria uh, situations. And at that time, uh, most people believed in witches, including uh, the ministry and uh, so, uh, but it spread like, like wildfire. Um, and there, the, uh, the Salem witch trials had already started, um, but they were smaller. There, was, there were more people in Andover accused of witchcraft than uh, in Salem. And, um, and Salem, it wasn't actually Salem like we think of today. Uh, it's Salem Village. And uh, you'll see on the map, I'll show you later, that that's really uh, Salem Village is uh, now Middleton, Danvers, uh, what, what used to be called Salem Village. So it was right next door, basically. It wasn't, you know, a lot, all the way over to today's Salem, which is kind of funny when you think about how much uh, hay they make off of witchcraft in, in Salem. But anyhow, um, so this is a long, long story, and uh, there's a great book that I got here, uh, Lynn, thank you, uh, at the uh, bookstore about the, uh, the whole witch trials and so forth. But um, they, uh, the way they try to tell this correctly, the way they uh, tried to determine whether you were a witch uh, was what they called a touch test. And they would bring someone who had been already affected by witchcraft under a witch's spell, they would bring that person to the, um, to a, a place, the, the uh, uh, town hall, and in this case, and uh, each accused witch would touch that person. And uh, if they were healed or no longer were afflicted, then they said, you're a witch. Uh, so these, these people from Salem Village came in, I think it was two young women. They came in uh, and they uh, were all agitated and, and distressed and had this affliction. And then the, each accused person uh, touched them. And in each case, they were like, oh, okay, now I'm, I'm fine. So it was a, this totally uh, arbitrary, subjective, uh, <laughs> non-scientific, to say the least, test. And so everybody who was accused was basically found guilty, and they were going to be thrown in jail. Um, so, and some of them ended up uh, being executed. 
Mary Osgood, her husband, John Jr., John Osgood Jr., was of the belief, as were many of the people, that uh, the best way to get out from under this was to confess, and then you'd be forgiven. That was the theory. <laughs> well, so Mary Osgood confessed and said, you know, she, she had uh, signed the devil's book and had been at this uh, whole baptism, uh, satanic baptism, up in Boxford. So she confessed to that. And so she got thrown in jail. Uh, and her husband, you know, was, uh, number one, there was this belief that you had to confess to get, uh, you know, uh, redemption. The other thing is, uh, at least I've seen in some of these uh, accounts, is that they believed it. They thought if somebody was accused of witchcraft, then they were a witch. So initially, John Osgood Jr. was like, you know, uh, confess, uh, but you must be a witch. Um, almost immediately, he and some of the other uh, people in, in, in Andover had second thoughts about this. And he, he was a, a bigwig in town. He was a selectman, a long-term selectman. Um, so, very shortly after this, he uh, started with others petitioning to get these uh, accused witches, so-called witches, released from jail. And Mary Osgood was released. Uh, other less fortunate, prominent people were not, and as I said, I think three or four uh, ended up being executed. So. Uh, it was a nasty business, and it took years, 10 years, before they really got out from under it um, and, and shut down these trials. Uh, but they were, um, there were a lot of people, um, at one point, Cotton Mather, uh, you know, uh, minister down uh, Plymouth Way, was, he was very much uh, on this kind of anti-witch kick. But he ended up thinking, ultimately, this had gone too far. So ultimately, the tide turned, and people started saying, this is, this is crazy. Um, but it, and then they, they didn't even really uh, finish it till 1711. So you know, 20, 20 years, 19 years of uh, having this over their head. But anyway, Mary Osgood came out OK. And, um, so I mentioned her son Peter basically had this uh, farm down in this area. Now a couple features, you see the Skug River. Um, this is a map also I got from the Historical Society here, uh, 1692 map. Um, I don't think this is necessarily 100% accurate. One thing you probably can't see this too well, but right down here is something called Osgood Hill. And that is Osgood Hill, Andover version. But Peter uh, didn't make his claim on this area until 1694. So the 1692 map, I'm not sure that that really, <laughs> that may have been a little bit ahead of it. Um, this, uh, you can't read, I'm sure, but this says the, uh, North End and South End. So that's, that was the beginning of what then became North Parish, South Parish, and ultimately North Andover, South Andover. Um, swamp. I don't know. This is all swamp. <laughs> I don't know how they farmed. I really don't. I, you know, I spent a lot of time in Hell Parker, and there are uh, stone walls everywhere. I mean, they farmed it. Uh, I don't know how, but you know that, that's kind of the story about of New England. Um, the Gibbet Plain. So anybody know what a gibbet is? It's kind of gruesome. Uh, a gibbet was a contraption whereby they would hang somebody but have them fixed uh, so that they were couldn't move. And in, in uh, Europe, a gibbet was like a metal enclosure. In, in the here, uh, 
they just basically tied people up. But the gibbet plain meant that was a, a place where they conducted executions. There's no record of that, uh, of, of people getting executed. And um, the, the records that do exist are more of the county seat. Um, so um, that happened in uh, Salem, the, the, what we call Salem today. Uh, but anyway, that, that, that's a, uh, a little bit odd. Oh, this is just a blow up of it. You can't, it's all fuzzy. But the, yeah, the gibbet plane. There's another uh, gibbet uh, in the area too. In uh, Groton is uh, Gibbet Hill, which now is a, uh, a wedding venue. I know that because my, <laughs> my, my son got married there. Uh, and they have a great, great restaurant there too, by the way. But um, same thing, Gibbet Hill uh, supposedly was a place of executions, but there, again, is no real record of it. So uh, Osgood Hill, uh, so what it actually is, is located is at the intersection of the North Andover, uh, Andover and North Reading line. And they initially just had a, a bunch of, a pile of rocks uh, to mark it. This marker was put in way later, 1904. Uh, so it's got Andover on one side and uh, the North Reading. Um, and this is right at the, the top of, uh, of Osgood Hill. So uh, kind of transitioning, I mentioned Peter Osgood sold his, uh, a big chunk of his farm to Samuel Jenkins. This is called the William Jenkins House, uh, but it actually was built by Samuel Jenkins in, eight, in 1758. Um, and William, it's called the William Jenkins House because he's, he's the famous one. But uh, Samuel was the first Jenkins uh, to really uh, settle down in this area. And I, I the records I've seen, there weren't Jenkins. Jenkins was not an original family, uh, but they ended up basically owning that same uh, piece of property that, that Peter Osgood did. So that's the William Jenkins house. And then this is the uh, Benjamin uh, Jenkins house. So he was the son of uh, Samuel, and he was the father of William, who we'll talk about. So that's, oops, meant to. So uh, this picture is actually taken in uh, 1905, I believe. So there's the house. There was a big barn. Uh, here are these guys, you know, with an ox and uh, regular manual plow. What's does interesting. Does still exist? Yeah, it does. I live there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why, that's. Kind of how I got hooked on this whole Jenkins thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so the house, yes, the house is still there. Both, both houses are still there. Um, this shows some porches that don't, aren't there anymore. So it's, it's kind of a big federal. And it, it was built in either 1807 or maybe 1803. I've seen both. I, I, I go with 1803. You know, why not? Uh, and as it says, it, it was a uh, post house. So um, it was a stagecoach stopover as people were going from Boston up to, they could go to the, <laughs> today's Salem, they could go to uh, Haverhill. Uh, the, the Haverhill, uh, well, Jenkins Road, as we call it today, in Andover, Boston Street, or in North Reading, it's uh, Haverhill Street. It was the Haverhill Highway uh, back then. But what's funny about this to me is, you know, here these guys are with a, you know, the old-fashioned plow and an ox, and yet there are um, telephone poles. So, you know, it was modernizing a little bit. Um, so, yeah, Benjamin Jenkins, uh, one of his sons, I think his youngest son, was William Jenkins. 
Um, so the Jenkins, and particularly William, who lived in that yellow house I showed you, um, he uh, developed uh, sawmills. Sawmills had already been, uh, early sawmills had been uh, put on the Skug and in the Harold Parker area. So at, at one time there were three sawmills. Um, and I think my house has a lot of uh, the lumber from those mills. Um, it, in the attic, it's got <laughs> one thing, it's like this, this big, it's, it's like a tree. Uh, the bark's peeled off, but it's a tree. <laughs> it's it's uh, holding the uh, roof up. And it's still holding up, so happy about that. But uh, yeah, so they, the uh, Samuel Jenkins had a, a big farm. Uh, it was kind of seasonal, so they farmed, and then in the off season, they did the uh, sawmill. Uh, and he also ended up uh, opening up right in his main sawmill a uh, soapstone quarry, and that quarry supplied soapstone, which is a very soft but really kind of pretty stone. So it was used in buildings in Boston. It was used for monuments, and then uh, it was used in uh, uh, for bowls and uh, decorations and things. Um, there was another sawmill, which is right off of Harold Parker Road. Um, and it's, uh, you, you can see it as you're driving down Harold Parker Road. The Jenkins Sawmill is basically going west from that glacial erratic. Uh, so the sawmill and the soapstone quarry are right next to each other. The, the uh, soapstone quarry, uh, the treasurer of the company, basically they had a company to run it and the treasurer ran off with all the money. Uh, so they shut, this, they shut the, uh, um, the quarry down. Uh, the, they kept having the sawmill in some shape or fashion going until about uh, the 1800s. Um, the, well, uh, we'll t and the, even into close to the 1900s um, when, I'm sorry, it is the 1900s, uh, that they converted from water driven off the skug to steam, which had a kind of a big impact we'll, we'll talk about. This is a, uh, a soapstone uh, mantle and fireplace from uh, the William Jenkins house, one of the 10 fireplaces in, in, in his house. <laughs> we have seven. <laughs> this, this is the, uh, what's called uh, Sawmill 2, which is right off Harold Parker Road. So as I say, you can, you can if you just uh, turn your head, you can see that. This is another quarry in HP, and this is uh, just south of Berry Pond, a little southwest. This is a granite quarry, and I don't know uh, who owned that. I can't, can't track that. I haven't seen any uh, names on that. I believe, though, that a lot of our foundation, which is huge granite blocks, came from this quarry. So this is uh, a map in the 1850s. This is actually, they called it a survey. Um, and this says Mrs. Jenkins. That was uh, Benjamin Jenkins uh, Jr.'s widow, I believe. Um, the, so you've got the William Jenkins. He, he, you can see he owns a couple of properties. This. This one right there could be right where that granite quarry is, so it's possible that William Jenkins owned that too. Um, this is his house, and then this is that sawmill, uh, the main sawmill. Okay, so I, I mentioned that he was uh, a uh, son of Benjamin. Um, he married a Farnham, you know, and all these names, uh, you know, just pretty 
they're, they're all uh, kicking around. So he, he was an abolitionist. They both were ardent abolitionists. Um, and, you know, well-intentioned, aggressive. Uh, so he, he was a fighter, and starting in the 30s. Um, so he, he believed in it strongly, and he, he basically, he, he, he lived it. So the, uh, the Jenkins uh, home became a major stop on the Underground Railroad, uh, and some said the major one in this area. So there's a quote. I, I won't read it for you, but um, this was a history done in 1898 that uh, kind of details um, that he was uh, pulling a lot of people through there. Um, there were, it's believed that there were two places for the uh, runaways to hide in this property. One was under a rock on the, in the property, uh, and the other was uh, a fireplace, behind the fireplace. And so they, there was a trap door, and you could uh, uh, hide, hide people in there. This kind of construction is kind of, that's how they built back then, and our house has the same thing. You had a big center chimney, and there's this huge uh, uh, channel. And in this case, they had it rigged so that they could uh, get people in there. I know you can't read this, but this is his uh, tombstone. And the, the uh, inscription is up above. So he, he lived uh, into 1870s, 1878. Uh, so he, he lived to see uh, the Emancipation Proclamation and everything he had worked for. So apparently, you know, the runaways uh, could come to his house. They, some of them uh, stayed and worked in the quarry, uh, or in the sawmill, rather. Um, so uh, this was a, a pretty key stop along the way. And as uh, one of the slides said, he had some pretty impressive guests from abolitionists like uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe and Frederick Douglass. William Garrison. So with all these sawmills uh, and with the way they uh, farmed, uh, they were basically clear cutting. And all that old growth forest was gone, um, virtually all of it. So uh, this became a, a real issue, and it, it compounded with the advent of um, the steam uh, sawmills. They could, they, could, uh, they could cut more, and there was more of a demand. There were towns like Lawrence that were industrializing, and so the demand for wood uh, was, was pretty intense, um, as opposed to the Indians who were forest managers. I think these were forest clearers. Uh, and so the area we know as Harold Parker was uh, a wasteland, as it became called. Uh, and you know, clear cut, um, not enough. There was some planting, but not nowhere near enough to keep up with it. So this, this became more and more of an issue. And uh, concurrently, there was more awareness that uh, people like Thoreau that this isn't a good thing. Uh, so, um, but it, it wasn't really uh, dealt with, and so the area was subject to forest fires, uh, and there were all other uh, infestations. There was a guy in Medford who uh, had a really great idea to import gypsy moths, and he had them, uh, at his home until they got away. <laughs> so there were uh, blights uh, of, and infestations of things like that. So this was, uh, they had no idea about invasive plants and, uh, uh, you know, to this day, uh, of course, we all have uh, issues with invasive plants and there, HP has uh, a lot of invasive plants. Uh, 
which is one of the things the friends group I'm part of we try to try to deal with uh, in one way or the other. So, um, but people started to wise up, and uh, uh, the state decided to establish an organization, uh, the Forest Conservation Group, and it was headed by Harold Parker. <laughs> so he he was pr uh, probably a, a ahead of his time, but in some ways, he was, uh, you know, he was a conservationist, but he also was. Um, what he really was worried about was just the, the lack of available lumber, the fact that they were be, uh, this area was becoming very dependent on lumber coming from outside of New England or, or way northern New England. But they were importing uh, lumber. So it was a big issue. So, so Harold Parker wanted to make sure there was a supply of lum lumber. Um, so he... Uh, he actually died shortly after he was made commissioner, um, but this uh, organization uh, was the start of what's now the DCR, which runs uh, Harold Parker, the Department of Conservation and Recreation. And, um, you know, they, they definitely uh, planted a lot of pine. But this is, back to that other comment, this is not, the old pine. <laughs> this is uh, this is an old growth pine. This is you know the kind of uh, white pine we have now, which is you know splinters and is is not all that strong. The the pine in, in uh, my house is, <laughs> is is as strong as oak. Uh, it, it's pretty amazing. So um, so Harold Parker was established in uh, 1916. So 550 acres to begin with. As remember, it was now over uh, 3,200 acres. But they, you know, consistently were buying it. When they bought it, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, the term in the globe, it's a wasteland. So um, it was. Nobody wanted it. Uh, nobody could do anything with it. You couldn't. You couldn't farm on it. Uh, you couldn't. Uh, do any, any milling anymore. There weren't, wasn't enough lumber. So it literally was a, a wasteland. Um, so over time, uh, it was reforested and starting right after the formation of the park. Um, but the, probably the real accelerator to make Harold Parker what it is today was the formation of the CCC in the 30s and the work that the CCC did, the Civilian Conservation Corps did at HP. So um, there were two camps at uh, Harold Parker. Um, the CCC itself uh, was basically taking unemployed young men, putting them to work in places like HP. Uh, so it, it was a way to uh, get people employed, but also uh, to really come out with some pretty positive outcomes. Um, so, yeah, there are two camps, and I, I mentioned earlier there are uh, 11 ponds, nine artificial, or man-made rather, and, and two natural. Um, so all of those ponds were built by the CCC, and all the dams uh, that basically made those ponds. Most of them are very shallow. Uh, you, if you drive by Field Pond or any of them, really, you'll see tree stumps and all that. They just uh, built dams and flooded the area and uh, uh, created these ponds. Field Pond, you know, large, largest pond in HP, uh, is quite shallow. Uh, so you can, it's 10 feet at most. Uh, and were they doing that for irrigation? I mean, why were they creating so many uh, ponds? Well, they they were also did a lot of uh, fish hatcheries. So there was uh, it was for fish, for recreation, um, but not not so much irrigation. The uh, field pond is the furthest south. Well, one. One of the furthest south, but it 
feeds into Martin Pond in uh, North Reading, and there's a dam that, <laughs> all of these dams uh, are pretty sketchy at this point. And you've, if you've driven through, you've seen that the Collins Pond Dam was just replaced, and it's, you know, it's a, I guess a modern version. That there was a fish hatchery building right in front of Collins Pond. That's gone now. So there, there hasn't really been any of that uh, fish hatchery stuff. Uh, but that, that was all uh, part of this conservation and recreation that they were trying to push. And then a, just a tremendous amount of tree planting, white pine and red pine. Uh, Primarily, although there, you know, today there's a lot of oak and uh, maple and in, in HP too. But well, I'll show you kind of what what we've got. Um, so yeah, the CCC ran through um, World War II basically. This, these are just some shots. It's Collins Pond. So so that is what's now Harold Parker Road. Uh, this, this is, they built, built out Harold Parker Road. So this is Harold Parker Road. That's, if you've driven down that road, that's the crazy turn. <laughs> that's a kind of a narrow turn. People drive too fast. And right about here is that uh, sawmill I talked about. This is a picture of the red pine, one of the red pine groves. They're beautiful. They're all dying right now. Uh, but they're beautiful, I, I th and they're, they're, they've been some blight, but they're also just kind of aging out. Uh, but there's a section of red pine in North Reading, uh, the very most southern part of Harold Parker, which is, uh, people call it the cathedral. It's, it's just spectacular. So this is uh, a map of all of the different types of uh, vegetation or, or um, trees that are in there now. So the red pine, that's that section I was talking about down in North Reading. And then up at Delano Pond, there's some beautiful red, red pine. Uh, it just, like, well, like a lot of pine, it, it's got a life cycle. And uh, since all of those trees were planted at the same time, they're all going at the same time. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna shift. Uh, and I'll, I'll uh, this is the wrap up here. So this, uh, yeah. today we're doing uh, uh, work as the Friends of Harold Parker. This is just an example of some of the stuff we do. We do cleanups, we do repairs. Um, We've been doing building trails. We've built bridges where we get permission. We've marked trails. That's a blue marker. So in the map, there are uh, uh, a number of the different trails that we've marked so that they're loops. Again, everybody gets lost in Hale Parker, but if you follow the uh, trail markers, you can do a loop. We uh, sponsor really a, a, a walkers group, and that's a Wednesday walkers. So they meet at 10 every Wednesday. and. Uh, it's a really active group. Uh, this is a Harold Parker really sponsored event, uh, winter solstice. Uh, <laughs> there's a fishing derby that the DCR sponsors, and we always uh, you know, have food and stuff at that. So that's that's pretty great. Uh, the Friends sponsor a, a, a race. It's a fun race, not. Uh, uh, not super serious or competitive. It's a family-friendly race, uh, the Berry Pond Scramble, and we've got this coming up next month on June 9th. Uh, so, love to have participants. Um, and I guess I, I I had a picture. I don't know what I did with it, but I did have a picture of that that latest uh, boardwalk we built, 170 feet. Um, the last three projects have all been because of beaver activity. Uh, you know, beaver are great for the ecology and the hydrology and they're, they're hell on <laughs> recreation. And uh, 
So they've, they've been flooding trails and uh, they don't have any predators, which is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, they're pre-Europeans, pre, uh, there were 200 million or 300 million uh, beavers in North America and they were almost wiped out. Uh, but they're coming back. <laughs> they're back, baby, and they want you to know it. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, I, I somehow I dropped that picture, but uh, that, that bridge project was sponsored by the Friends, and then basically we paid for it. We did all the permits, we paid for it, and then the NEMBA, the New England Mountain Bike Association, did all the work. <laughs> so uh, we've got a lot of volunteers in both groups, uh, and we cooperate uh, tightly on those kind of projects. All right. So does anybody have any questions for Andy? <laughs> yeah, does Harold Parker go on both sides of 114? It does, yeah. Uh, in North Andover, um, Barry Road uh, in North Andover, right on the side of that is uh, some more Harold Parker. Well, I'm thinking uh, Ben Farnham has a large property, Boston Hill Farm there. Yeah. And back, if you go down his road, it allows you to go down it. Yeah. There was a sawmill down there. Was that one of the sawmills you're talking about? No, that's a different one. But, but yes, there, um, there is a whole section of, it's not really contiguous, it's, uh, it's a, if you've got a map, it's on the map, but uh, there is a section up there. And that's where the, uh, the tallest hill in Harold Parker is. I'm a relatively new mountain biker as well, and, and Harold Parker really is a, a treasure, and NEMS has been they're fabulous in the trail development. But my question is more historical in terms of the, the roads um, in Harold Parker don't compare to other certain state forests that are more designed like carriage roads or things like that. The roads in Harold Parker seem very, very primitive mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that they're extremely rocky, um, not, they haven't been filled in, they haven't been graded or anything like that. Yeah. It, is it that they, were, they weren't used very much by the CCC? Is that no, they were built by the CCC. Yeah. But they're, they're fire roads. Um, okay. Well, they're, they're, I, and I should have mentioned this too. So with all this reforestation, part of the idea was that Harold Parker would be uh, uh, basically used for timber. So kind of an active site. It's way less active, but you'll see cutting done. Uh, in the last year or so, there was a huge pile of uh, pine that was cut, and it was in the Jenkins lot. Uh, but it, you're right. So the biggest problem that the, the friends are trying to help with is that the DCR has no money. And so there are a lot of things that should be done uh, that they can't do. They're understaffed. Uh, they can get money for a huge project like that Collins Dam, but they can't get a project to build a, a bridge across the stream. So that's why these and volunteers. The trails near that dam, for example, are wonderful. You know, they're, yeah. They're, they're great, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now the the maintenance is is. Horrible. A lot of stuff hasn't really been, not much has been done since the CCC, which is why these dams now have to be replaced. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. First question is a really easy question. Where can I get one of those sweet, sweet maps? <laughs> I live very close to um, yep. Parker, and it's yep. one of my favorite places. Mm -hmm. It's online. Um, second is, what's your favorite spot? My favorite spot. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite spot in Harold Parker. Um, oh, that's tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I do have more. Um, does anybody else need one? Yeah, that is so hard. Uh, so I, I, I mentioned 
these uh, red pine groves. Spectacular. And never did. The where, where was by Lord Reddy, way down there. Yeah. 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 Um, so I, if you're just looking for, uh, you know, something that'll make you feel really good, that's great. If I'm looking for crazy mountain biking, <laughs> that's a whole different thing, which is what I'm usually looking for. So, uh, and Harold Parker, uh, most of the trails are intermediate to advanced. There's not a lot of beginner stuff. And I, I've got the scars to show it. I, I learned the hard way. Yeah, hey, Hobbit, what? Um, is, uh, is sawmill number two technically on private property at this point? I don't believe so. I was talking to the guy in the house next to it that um, was moving out and he had this, all the stuff in his front yard and got the chat and he said that that was actually part of his land. Um. No. Yeah, it, well, if you look at the map, it could be private, yeah. Because there, there are two sections. Um, no, no, actually, it, according to the map, which take this with a little bit of a grain of salt, it's as accurate as we can make it. The skug goes right through, uh, or, or that sawmill number two is on the skug, and that, according to the map, is HP. But yeah. Are you replacing the dam between Collins and Bracken also? Um, that's the next one, I believe. Yeah. But well, now I mean the the uh, field field pond. That was just a few years ago, so they do seem to be cranking them out. They they have to, right? They're they're falling apart, and and um, they're dangerous too, in a way. Yeah, that that's that's brutal. Yes. Uh, is the beaver activity new, or has it been there a long time? It's picked up pretty dramatically. You know, there, there's just, there's more, this is good. Uh, there's more wildlife in Harold Parker. I have seen quite a few fisher in there, and fishers were almost extinct. Beavers were wiped out. But over the last, I've noticed it picking up over the last 10 years in particular. No, they wanted it. They wanted it. But you can only use it in, when the campground's not open. Well, you can use it any time. You, you, can't, you can't go into the campground, theoretically. Well, they don't really, I know. They don't want you to do that. Yeah. I know everybody does. Yeah. Yeah. And my other, my other, I know. <laughs> um, but I like the way you put the FO, you know, HP on the both sides of the bridge. Somebody's yeah. very talented. You're all very talented. <laughs> Um, that, that, you, you need a machine-driven router to do that. I know. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> yeah, no. But I also wonder, with all the, um, the storms that we've had in the last couple of years, you, know, you mentioned that they're having a hard time keeping up with um, uh, keeping keeping things straight. Every way, everywhere you go on those trails now, all the trees have come down. Yeah. You know, well, I can tell you one thing. Yeah. DCR didn't didn't clear any of those trees, no, I know. and I can't. I but won't I tell you who did. I won't. Yeah, no, they, 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 they can't. They, they're unable to, to keep up with it. And for better or worse, 
a huge amount of the effort of the DCR at Harold Parker is about the campground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, it's a money maker, it's, yeah. it's a big thing. Uh, so that, there's a tremendous amount of their resources put into that. Yeah. And they, as far as I know, they have literally no, little to no budget to do the kind of maintenance, you know, on the roads or whatever. They, they just don't do it. Yeah, you, in the back, you had. Um, I also was gonna ask about the microburst and because my husband and I walk often um, in Carroll Parker and can't imagine the destruction or can't believe. Um, but thank you for all the work that your group is doing. Um, I wonder if you've ever heard of AmeriCorps and Triple C, which is the National Civilian Community Corps. Mm -hmm. um, I know, I don't know what it takes to get a team to come, but I know that they go and a team would live in the state park and so they were, um, kind of came from the CCC, um, so they could possibly do some of that work if the DCR could bring a team or the friends. It's an idea. Yeah, no, it's a good idea. It, they, uh, it, that has been done. Oh, really? Yeah, but not, not for a whole summer. It, uh, a week or two at a time over the last, there have been one or two of those, um, but it's not, probably not enough. Um, and I think, you know, back to the point on the fire roads, that's just a kind of a lousy job, but somebody needs to do it. Uh, and that is getting the equipment and all that stuff. So that's kind of beyond what the friends or NEMBA can do. We, most, we, everything we do is with hand tools for the most part. So, but I think, um, there's a new park supervisor uh, at Harold Parker. The uh, existing one retired last year, so we've got a new guy who's got uh, some energy and you know open to new ideas. And um, and and the other guy had set up the AmeriCorps, but I, it was a very sporadic. So yeah, I think that's a great idea. And Thank I, you for admitting that most of the mountain biking trails are intermediate to advanced. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's not a beginner. It's a, it's no, a, it's a tough place, but it's you know it's so much fun and there's just yeah. so many places to go there. And yeah, uh, and it was the wicked ride of the east that got me into mountain biking. Yeah, yeah, that's that. Me too. Yeah. Me too. That was great. So Andy, you talked about all the the pines dying out at the same time. That um, I know the the line is the best time to plant a tree is ten years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so are there if DCR has no money, are there plans or money to start reforesting where these, and replanting where these trees are dying that were all planted at the same time? Not that I know of. That doesn't mean it's not happening. And it is one of the missions, so to speak, of the DCR and, and Harold Parker. So it should be, and it, there may be some, but I, I, I'm not aware of it. That's a good question, though. I'll, we meet regularly with uh, Dave Dees, who's the uh, park supervisor, so that's, that's a good question. Find out what's going on. And then if people wanted to join Friends of Harold Parker, what would they do? <laughs> um, I, I think all our info's on this map, and then uh, go to our website, uh, friendsofharoldparker.org. <coughs> Yeah, love, love to, or talk to me after, you know, love to uh, get more members. Uh, we're always looking for members, we're looking for uh, volunteers, we're looking for uh, board members, so. Besides the beavers, are there any other uh, wildlife that are causing damage or problems for you folks? Mm -hmm. um, not, that, not that I'm aware of. Uh, and what are you legally allowed to do with the beaver? <laughs> well, the DCR can uh, trap them. They can, they can get a permit to trap. Um, they, in the last five years, there was one effort to trap. And uh, the, the people who were doing the trapping were harassed so much by uh, hikers or walkers that they said, forget it. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't know. And the other thing that you can do um, is use what is called euphemistically a beaver deceiver. And there are beaver deceivers in, in HP now in a couple places. There's one near that uh, William Jenkins house. Uh, and th that was, that was uh, kind of co-sponsored by the Andover Conservation Commission. Here's what I've learned about this. Cause I, I, I kind of like the beaver deceiver idea. You basically uh, put a pipe or a conduit through the dam, and it allows the water to flow out. And so the water level doesn't get as high. You can kind of control what height you want. And you have the pipe far enough away from the beaver, uh, from the dam, so that the running water is what gets them going, right? So if they hear running, if you, if you go and um, destroy a dam or, or take, you know, try to take some of the material out of the dam, it'll be repaired by the next morning. <laughs> they, they are, because the sound of running water drives them crazy, I guess. Um, so uh, these beaver deceivers kind of solve that, that problem. They're, they're, uh, they're somewhat effective. I guess I would say, and uh, not everybody likes that idea. So, so it, there are mixed feelings about that within the DCR, and you need permits for it. The reason that the, um, they didn't have any trouble with this kind of massive beaver deceiver uh, near that Jenkins house is because there are so many properties uh, on the skug at that point. So it becomes a health issue if you've got septic systems and you've got uh, flooding water because of the beaver, the, the health department will be all over that. To put a beaver deceiver, and I'm making this a longer story probably, but you need permission from the Andover Conservation, or the, excuse me, the Town Conservation Commission and the health department. Most of the other uh, type of projects that we do, you just need the Conservation Commission. Yeah, and that was put in by, you know, a professional beaver deceiver guy. <laughs> it needs to be maintained, too. That's the other thing. But it, that's the solution. I, that's the one I kind of like. Uh, and, and otherwise, we're going to have to put boardwalks in everywhere. And that uh, now the permitting for that used to be very simple. You used to be able to do it at a town level. Now we have to uh, go through the, a, a process that, it, like this, the big one we just did took three years to permit. Partly because we didn't know what we were doing. But, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a big deal. So why don't we grab this? Why don't we yeah. get Yeah, with you. Sure. Great. So thank you again. Thank you, thank you all for coming. <laughs>